All right. <laughs> yeah, hard to follow. Uh, but here we go. I'll do my best. Are you ready? Let me think of something to say then. Uh, this is a, this is a second in the series that the preachers here are doing. So uh, this is a, a Facebook theology or like meme theology is a way of saying it too. Uh, and it's, this is a big one. This is one that you've all heard before, many times before. As a matter of fact, this is a phrase that many, many people, the majority of people, when they do surveys and they ask, name a scripture, can you say a scripture? Even though this is not in scripture, this is what people say. You know what it is. It's in the bulletin. <laughs> but it is, God helps those You've heard it before, haven't you? <laughs> I have a history with this phrase. Um, at, when, we, when I was in high school, we went on these outstanding mission projects around the country. And always when we went on a mission project somewhere, North Carolina or West Virginia, we'd come back and somebody in the church would say, why don't you do anything here in town? And so my youth leader, Bob Atkins, decided to put together a project for a woman in town, a widow, in our church, who lived up in Loves Park, not far from our church, who had lost her husband just recently and had, was having trouble getting some of the stuff that she needed done around the yard and the house. And so we went there over a course of about a month on Saturday. And we helped all, you know, with all of those projects. And when you went to her house, she always invited you in. There's a little tiny entryway that was tiled and on the left was her living room carpeted and we didn't want to go into her living room and drag all the stuff from outside into there so we stood in this little entryway and then while we'd been working there after we'd been working there for about an hour she would invite us in and say give us cookies and something to drink and we probably made more out of snacks than she got out of work from us um, but she would invite us into that little room, and right straight ahead, when you enter the front door, there are two framed cross-stitch pieces. And the first one said, oh, by the way, I, I brought this just to share with you. This is a total aside, um, and, but it is, I've always thought that there are certain phrases in the Bible that get way too much attention in cross-stitch and needlepoint. <laughs> you know, faith, hope, and love are all over. They're on every pillow in the, uni in the universe. And if, if there's a deer or a stream or a tree or a shepherd or a sheep, that's going to get a cross-stitch, right? And so I say, when I'm reading scripture and I come across a passage that I think is underrepresented, I say, that would make a good cross-stitch. <laughs> And so there, the one is, my favorite is, I still haven't seen it yet, is from, uh, you know, uh, Acts, the book of Acts. And Peter has a vision that tells him that it's okay to sit down with, with other people and have a meal with them. And he has a vision of food coming down from heaven. And there's this big voice that comes with this vision that tells him it's okay to eat things that are not kosher when he's doing it in the name of Jesus Christ to reach out to somebody and connect with them. And he sees all these different foods coming down, and a voice comes from heaven and says, Get up, Peter. Kill and eat. And I think, man, that would make... That would make an awesome throw pillow. I mean, if you want to start a conversation and somebody's sitting down on your couch, I mean, that's... That's a spiritual conversation to have. So my wife made me one. <laughs> It is cross-stitch. It is Proverbs 26, 11, one of my favorite passages of Scripture. Do you know it? Some of you might know it right away. As a dog, <laughs> it's hard to even say it, isn't it? As a dog returns to its vomit, so a fool returns to his folly. One of my favorite, pa and the little sick dog right here. And there's little cross-stitch vomit right underneath it. <laughs> I 
All right. So that, that was Amy. So that's an aside. That, that has nothing to do with anything. So two cross-stitch pieces straight in front of you walk in the door. The first one says, Now abideth faith, hope, and charity, these three. But the greatest of these is charity. But yes, love. Charity in the King James Version. Because her grandmother made it. This woman who was in her 80s, when we met her in the 80s, so her grandmother may have made that in the 1800s. 1880s. Um, and the second one right below that was God helps those who help themselves. And I, I was talking about it with Bob, my youth pastor, and Bob is an extremely intelligent guy. I mean, he knows everything. And he was well read. You know, I, I, I've tried to read his PhD on grid group analysis in the Pauline community, and I struggled to get through it. And he said, you know, I'm a little teenage kid. I hadn't read through the whole Bible yet. I'd seen parts of it. I'd read parts of it. We'd done skits about some of the parts of the Bible. And he said, you know, that's not in the Bible. And I said, I'm pretty sure it is. So in order to prove Bob wrong, because that was a dream of mine, <laughs> I decided that before next Sunday, I'd just read the Bible. <laughs> yeah. And so I sat down to read the whole Bible. I did not finish in that first week, um, but I did finish in about a month. Now, I have to admit, I never found that phrase. What I have to admit is that it may be in the book of Numbers, because I gave up on the book of Numbers. <laughs> I mean, have you ever read Numbers? It's literally a census. It's names you can't read and the number of people in each tribe. There are 76,000 people in this tribe. And then when they wanted to organize the nation, they said, let's put 76,000 people over here and 60,000 people over here. And all these names that you can't pronounce. So it could be in there. I still haven't found it. But it was not in the Bible. Today I want to share one small way that that phrase is true. And then two major ways in which it is really false. And it's fine to just jettison that phrase altogether. We don't need it in the church. There are other ways to say what that says without holding on to that phrase. This is the way that it's true. You heard it from 2 Thessalonians when the scripture was read. We do and we are told and we are called to participate in work. Not just sit around and wait for God to deliver everything for us. We're called to do something, to make it happen. To work with God, with the Spirit of God, to make something happen. And so you hear that out of that letter to the Thessalonians. The one who is unwilling to work shall not eat. We hear that some among you are idle and disruptive. And this is one of my favorite phrases. They are not busy. They are busy, <laughs> busy bodies. Some people we command and urge in the Lord, such people we command and urge in the Lord, Jesus Christ, to settle down and earn the food that they eat. So we're called to do our part. God gives us gifts. All of us have multiple gifts, spiritual gifts, that we can give to the church, that we can offer to other people, that we can share with this whole world. We're not given those gifts to make a name for ourselves or to make a profit. We're given those gifts to put them together with other people's gifts to answer the basic needs here in our community and then all around us in the community that we touch when we go home and when we go to work and when we go to school. And hopefully, with all of our gifts coming together, we can do something extraordinary in the name of Jesus Christ so that the, the whole world can see the light of Christ. 
We each have unique gifts. I cannot sing in a way that would bring someone closer to God. I can sing. But I can't sing in a way that's going to draw someone close to the Spirit of God. But I can pray out loud. Incidentally, you can too. I know some of you don't think you can pray out loud. And if you get invited to pray, you freeze in that moment. But I can convince you that you can pray. You know, there's a movie. You remember when that, that oil rig caught fire in the Gulf of Mexico? I don't even remember the name of it, but, and the people were rescued off of it. And when they were drawn onto the ship, there was a movie about this. I don't even remember the name of the movie. This just popped into my head just now. What's that? Yeah. And so in that movie, there's this moment where, where they've drawn everybody onto the ship. And then someone begins to pray. And it is, it's like one of the most, you know, I felt the hair on the back of my neck stand up. It was so powerful, that moment of prayer. Someone who is brave enough to, to stand up and pray out loud. You know what that prayer was? Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. I mean, there's nothing more profound than that. That's why Jesus gave it to us. If you're in the middle of a room and somebody says, can someone pray? Your answer is, yes, I can pray. And if you can't think of anything else to pray, pray that prayer. I didn't mean to say that either. That wasn't part of the sermon either. <laughs> so now I have to find my way back. <laughs> so I, just as I said, I don't have that gift of, of voice that the choir does. And when I first came and started attending the church, I said, hey, I'm going to help with the soundboard. Because um, I used, I mean, I've worked on a lot of soundboards. And they were showing me the soundboard and how it's programmed. And I, I have to tell you, I cannot program that soundboard. But I can paint. Pretty good at it, actually. When all the gifts in this room come together, imagine the ministry that would be each of us has some gift given by God and each of us has a job to do and a role to play and if we don't do it something really is missing in the life of the church I cannot fix a broken spirit but I can listen and you see here is where we're getting closer to the difference between what we are able to contribute and what what God can do because the reality of salvation history is that it's all about God people helping people who could not help themselves. And one of the central truths of our faith is that only God can save us. Your salvation, my salvation, cannot be earned. It cannot be made. It cannot be obtained by us. It cannot be bought. There is no YouTube D DIY video about building your own salvation, just as it says in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8, for it is by grace that you have been saved through faith. This is not from yourselves. It is a gift of God. So we come to that first point where God helps those who help themselves is not true. It is not true because Jesus implanted in us a driving concern for the poor and the needy. Our actions are a reflection of God's will and the purpose of God in this world. And they're a reflection of what God has already done for us. We do something for someone else because we know the grace of God. It's touched us. It's changed us. It's shaped us. It's given us hope and power and life. So from the book of James, which is our scripture for today, hear this word. My dear brothers and sisters, take note of this. Everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, slow to become angry. 
Because human anger does not produce the righteousness that God desires. Therefore, get rid of all moral filth and the evil that is so prevalent, and humbly accept the word planted in you, which can save you. And do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. Anyone who listens to the word but does not do what the word says is like someone who looks at his face in a mirror and after looking at himself goes away and immediately forgets what he looks like. But whoever looks intently into the perfect law that gives freedom and continues in it, not forgetting what they had heard but doing it, they will be blessed in what they do. Those who consider themselves religious and yet do not keep a tight rein on their tongues deceive themselves and their religion is worthless. Religion that God our Father accepts as pure and faultless is this, to look after orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself from being polluted by the world. He says, humbly accept the word planted in you, which can save you. And do not merely listen to the word, but do what it says. So we heard that word here in this church years ago, even when we were children, Matthew 25. I was hungry and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. That seed, that word was planted in you, planted in us. We heard that word. It was in us. And this church rose up and called a food truck here so that we could share with people who need it. That word was planted in you and you rose up and you packed and you sent how many meals? I was astounded by that number. Approaching one million meals? Astounding. Into the world. God planted the word in us. God planted, God planted the word in Amy to embarrass her a third time today. She goes to work one day. And there's a co-worker whose husband needs a liver. And so Amy says, well, I'll be tested. I'll see if it's a, a, it could be a match. And she gets tested. It could be a match. And so we enter the process. She enters that process. And ends up giving this man that she really didn't know very well at all her liver. Well, two-thirds of her liver. I mean, that's astounding to me. You know, the word is planted in you all your life, years ago. And then all of a sudden, you hear that calling and you see that opportunity to do something for somebody who cannot help himself, cannot fix this without somebody else stepping in. I mean, I can imagine doing it for my child or for my spouse, for my family, my brother, my sister. But to do it for, you know, a second point of connection is astounding to me. But God planted the word in us and expects us to follow through to fruition, to practical action. Because that is true religion. We don't just hear it, but when we hear it, we do it. So the second way that God helps those who help themselves is not true is the whole concept of grace, which is the center of our faith. From 1 Peter chapter 3, For Christ also suffered for sins once for all, the righteous for the unrighteous, in order to bring you and me to God. If the church was a place only for fully righteous, entirely sanctified people, how many of us could be here? It always amuses me in all my years of ministry when someone would criticize the church by saying, 
The church is filled with hypocrites. And you know what I would say to that? Absolutely. You're absolutely right. I, and I see your hypocrites, and I can raise you. We've got cheaters and adulterers and thieves and murderers. We have users and abusers and manipulators and liars. We have grumps. And the church has me, too. But it's a place where people can come, people who acknowledge that they're not yet perfect. They can come and say, God, on my own, I cannot live up to the high ideal of Jesus Christ. Please help me. And the reality that I've known all my life, since I was in that youth group in middle, in middle school and high school in Rockford, Illinois, is that I don't want to hang out with people who believe that they've already arrived. In a church that thinks it has all of the answers. With people who have decided who is in and who is out, who is worthy and who is not, who is saved and who is unredeemed or even unredeemable. I want to be with the people who can acknowledge that this is not their church, but it is Christ's body. And that they would not or really could not be here except by the grace of God. People who boldly acknowledge that it is God's invitation that drew them here in the first place. And acknowledge that when they've come close to holiness in their lives, that is the spirit of God working in them. People who can acknowledge that, like even me, that they did not earn their place in the church because of ordination. People who can say, I didn't earn my place by putting in 500 hours of service here in this church, or by being a member here for 120 years, or by giving so many thousands of dollars. People who simply come and acknowledge that they did not earn their place at all. I want to be with the people who say, thank God. Thank God for the grace that got me here. Because I know those are Jesus' people. And because I know that they're going to look at me when I walk in the door and they're going to say, welcome home. I give thanks to the God for the grace that brought you here. Because that's how I came to be a member of this church. In an invitation in Rockford, Illinois that happened 40 some years ago. Where I found a youth group that welcomed me in. In the world of middle school and of high school, I was a bit broken out of place, and definitely not sanctified. But Jim McKay, our youth leader, said in every action, in every gesture that he gave and offered and showed, said to me, I thank God for the grace that brought you here. And then he said, here is the word of God. I can't wait to see what might grow from that seed. So I thank God for the grace that called me here to this place, to all of you. The word is planted deeply within you, and you are bearing great fruit. But remember, all that we have, and all that we are, and all that we can ever be, is by the grace of God. Let's give that grace away to all the people that we can find. Because there are people all around us who desperately need it and don't know how to find it. And we are in the business, God's business, of helping people who cannot help themselves. Pray with me. God of grace, move in our midst. Inspire our hearts and lift us up. Show us the gift and the grace and the light all around us and the people who are sitting here with us. And show us the darkness in the world that needs that grace and that light and that hope and send us there.
In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen.